thank you everyone for um, joining us and um, thank you um, Jean Claire for that introduction. Um, I think it's no surprise to any of us that no country in the world has achieved gender equality, but there are major variations across countries and that is really what this index is trying to measure. Where exactly do those disparities lie? And why is that important? Of course, it's a human rights challenge, but this is, of course, an economic challenge as well. Um, countries that are not capitalizing upon one half of their available human resources will be undermining their competitive potential. And so the Gender Gap Index seeks to provide a framework to capture the size of uh, the magnitude and the direction of gender-based uh, inequalities to become a tracking tool over time to catalyze perhaps best practice exchange between um, low and high ranking countries and finally to create great global awareness um, of an issue that has uh, challenges but also opportunities involved. There are four main features of the index. Um, first of all, it's trying to capture the gaps rather than levels. So for example, um, having an index that tells Bangladesh that it has um, lower levels of education for women than Sweden is not extremely useful because they already know that. It's a country that is poorer and for both women and men there are low, lower levels of education than, for example, Sweden. However, if we're able to create an index that allows Bangladesh to know that its gap on education is bigger, for example, than in Pakistan, that is something more comparable and perhaps an impetus for changes in policy. The second um, main feature of the index is that it looks at outcomes rather than enabling factors. So the index ranks countries according to labor force participation rates of women as compared to those of men, but does not include factors such as the number of weeks of maternity leave that are allowed. That's an enabling factor. The third feature is that it rewards equality rather than the supremacy um, or advantages of one um, sex over the other. So we reward up to parity. For example, a country such as Sweden, which has 1.5 women for every man in tertiary education, will not get extra points as compared to a country that has parity. And finally, it's comparable across time and comparable relative to an equality benchmark. So we have a scale of 0 to 1, with 0 representing inequality and 1 representing equality, and this remains fixed over time, allowing us to track progress over time. There are four main areas that the index looks at. Economic participation and opportunity, political empowerment, health and survival, and educational attainment. Um, there are 14 variables that enter the index. 13 come from publicly available hard data sources such as the UNDP, the ILO, the World Health Organization, and one comes from the Executive Opinion Survey of the World Economic Forum. In the health and survival category, two variables. Uh, we look at the healthy life expectancy of women as compared to the healthy life expectancy of men. This is basically the regular life expectancy um, numbers that you may have seen, but taking away the number of years lost to disease and disability. The second um, area that we look at in this particular sub-index is the sex ratio at birth. So here we're trying to isolate countries which may have a missing women problem. The second category, educational attainment. We look at four different things. Literacy rates and the gap between women and men on this and then primary, secondary, and tertiary enrollment. In the economic participation opportunity category, we're trying to capture three basic concepts. One is simply the gap in participation, and here we're looking at labor force participation rates. The second is the gap in remuneration. We do this through two different variables. One is the UNDP's hard data statistic on estimated earned income. And the second is from the survey. And there we're really trying to capture do women and men for similar work have a wage differential. The third concept is the advancement of women. And here we're looking at women's proportion among senior officials, legislators, and managers, and um, women's proportion among technical and professional workers. Finally, political empowerment, uh, we're looking at the ratio of women to men in parliament, in ministerial positions, and in executive office in the last 50 years. There's clearly one drawback here. We don't have data on women in local um, leadership positions of local government. And unfortunately, no database of this exists yet at a global level, but as soon as it does, I'm sure we'll include that in the index. 
Um, how we construct the index, uh, we take ratios, women to men, it's truncated at the equality benchmark because we're trying to reward parity rather than one sex's advantage over the other. Um, within each in sub-index, we use uh, weights that are derived from standard deviations. And finally, we take an unweighted average of the four different sub-indices so as not to give more weight to one or the other. The index this year covers 128 countries. Last year we began with 115. Um, we've covered uh, all of the e current and candidate EU countries, over 20 from Africa, over 20 from Latin America, um, and over 15 from uh, Middle East and North Africa. So we, we've uh, done well in terms of getting global coverage. <coughs> I think I will now pass over to Laura Tyson uh, for the for an overview of the Actually, before Laura speaks, why don't I might give her, uh, an introduction to our panelists who might help talk about the audience. And you've just heard from Sadia Zahidi, who is a co-author of the report. She's the head of the World Economic Forum Women and Leaders Program, which aims to create awareness and catalyze change by benchmarking and tracking the global gender gap. Uh, Zahidi was uh, previously an econ economist with the Forum's Global Competitive Program. Um, we also have, we're very fortunate to have uh, Laura Tyson with us, you're going to hear from in a moment. Uh, she's a co-author of the report, a professor of business administration and economics at the Haas School of Business at uh, UC Berkeley. And Laura was formerly the dean of the London Business School, dean of the Haas School, and many of you will recall her as the um, President Clinton's national economic advisor. Uh, and she, at that time, was the highest ranking woman in the Clinton White House. And, and perhaps we'll have an even higher ranking woman in a Clinton White House soon. Um, <laughs> uh, we also have uh, Ricardo Hausman, uh, who another co-author of the study. Um, he is a director of Harvard's Center for International Development and a professor of the practice of economic development at the Kennedy School of Government. Previously, he served as the first chief economist of the Inter-American Development Bank, and he's also served as chair of the IMF World Bank Development Committee. And finally, we have um, Beth Brook, who is the global vice chair of strategy, strategy and regulatory affairs for Ernst & Young where she also plays a leading role in setting the strategic direction of the organization around the world. And she'll be able to talk to us about the um, business implications of the, of the gender study that we're going to hear more about. And uh, before we go on to our panel, um, let me uh, turn the floor over to Laura Tyson. OK, I'll just say, uh, uh, really, I want to spend most time on uh, some questions. So let me just, here are the rankings. Sorry, is, it this, is this right? This is the, this is the... Um, yeah. I think we'll leave the rankings to Q&A because I would like to just, I mean, everybody's interested in their own country's rankings or how the ranking of their country compares to others. <coughs> I, I want to just sort of note what, what we included here. So there were 128 countries, 93% of the world's population. You are included depending upon the data availability of your country. So if you're not included, uh, the main, the answer is you don't have uh, the data that we need to really give you a fair representation. Um, as far as the patterns are concerned, I just want to point out, because I think this is really quite interesting, that basically what, we're, what we found last year and this year is that the major uh, gaps uh, in health and education, most countries have done very well in. So when we put it all together in a global index, we can see that 96% of the health gap, 92% of the education gap, has been closed, where countries uh, definitely show wide variability and a significant gap uh, to equality are in the economic outcome and the political outcome. So that's something we might want to talk about. Um, we did a number of regional uh, comparisons. And this year, also something very interesting, we sort of took countries by income categories. Even though we tried very hard in our work to say, let's take out development levels and look at how countries perform independent of development levels, we did also look at countries uh, by development groups as well. Um, so the regional performances, you'll see uh, we do them overall. We do them by economic opportunity by each of the, of the variables. I want to get to uh, my sort of favorite part of the conversation, and this is the link with economic performance. So obviously, as a business school dean, 
one of the things that attracted me to uh, this study was because I have been following over, actually over the years of my personal career, but in particular over the last decade, the growing evidence of, uh, that is real evidence now, uh, a link between um, the opportunities that women have economically and educationally and health area and political area and the performance of an economy at the national level. So as Sadi already said, the simple logic here is that one half of the talent pool of nations is female. And so one, if you educate and maintain the health of and give economic and political opportunity to that talent base, you're likely to have a healthier economy. And um, you will see in the, I don't know if this is in your, yes. You will see that one of the things we found both this year and last year is that if you rank countries on their competitiveness index, which is one of the wonderful pieces of data we get every year from the World Economic Forum, and you rank them on their gender gap, and you sort of look, you can see a correlation. Now, I'm an economist. I know correlation doesn't prove anything. You have to do all of the logic behind it. But the logic, both analytically and empirically from other studies, would support the reason why you see this positive relationship. You also see a positive relationship between uh, the uh, gender gap and uh, GDP per capita. So those three things, GDP per capita, national competitiveness, and uh, gender gap performance. Um, if you think about it uh, by saying the utilization of the talent pool, this is an issue both for developing countries, and, but it's also an issue for developed countries. Think about uh, a major challenge facing the developed countries. Europe. It's basically getting their labor force participation rates up and dealing with an aging population. Uh, clearly, they're going to have to mobilize more women into the workforce. And in order to do that, they're going to have to give them more responsibility, more advancement opportunities, more wage and quality opportunities. So if you take a very developed country like Germany or a country that is really very poor but has a significant potential talent base. Imagine if you could educate and move into much higher productivity activities the female labor force in the Indian countryside. I mean, an amazing development potential story. Uh, so that both developed and developing countries, this is a very important part of their competitiveness. So why don't I stop there, because I want to leave time for conversation. Turn it over to Ricardo. Thank you, Laura. It's, it's really a pleasure to be presenting this, uh, this report now for, for the second year running, and I hope, I hope it's something that, uh, that continues. It's, it's based on this philosophy, which I think uh, the World Economic Forum has, has been very important in, in disseminating the, the idea that what does not get measured does not get done. Right? So, so if, we don't, if we don't measure things and we don't put it on the table, we don't get national discussions going, to see if we can do something about it. And interestingly enough, I'm very encouraged by the fact that some of the countries that appear as the lousiest in, in the index or are, are some of the countries that are trying to do the most to deal with the problem. So I, I think that that's, a, that's an important uh, contribution. The second element I'd like to point out is that we make a big effort to try to be very inclusive. We try to put 93% of the world's population that obviously means that we are we are for we force ourselves to be unfortunately less deep in the kind of analysis we can do on each one of the countries. So, so uh, 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 that doesn't mean that at the national level there shouldn't be a discussion that goes much more deeply into the sources of of, of what we find. The third element is that we use official data. So, when people ask why did you rank my country so lousy? And, and we say, well, we can do it. It's your number. It's your data. It's a, it's a, don't blame the messenger. We just collected your numbers and everybody else's, and we're telling you how you rank yourself. Um, now, having said this, I, I come out after looking at so much of these statistics with this somewhat of an optimistic view. Um, we, uh, there are gaps, there are very important gaps, but uh, these gaps are narrowing in many countries. And in many countries they are narrowing 
at a speed that surprises me. It depends on what your priors are. But I, I find it extremely surprising that in 83 out of 141 countries in this world, there are more women than men in college. That an eye opener. I think that's that's a fact that you know I'd like to ponder upon. Okay. It, the second one is that out of the 115 countries we ranked last year in this year, uh, only 25 countries lower their actual index. The other countries improve their absolute index. So there is a trend towards improvement. Okay. Now, some of the countries that did not improve their index are at the bottom of the index. And those are the more worrisome because they're very, they ranked very poorly and on top of that, uh, the tendency is not to improve. So, yeah. Now, uh, this, this process whereby um, uh, things have been improving have a certain sort of like social logic. And I would like to just stress a little bit uh, the, the, the social logic they have. Because when we look at education, for example, we look at participation in primary, secondary, and tertiary education of today's young people. And there, there has been a remarkable reduction in the gaps. So that in almost half of the country, Secondary and tertiary school enrollment of women is above that of men. And that's, that's, a, a, that, that's very encouraging. But when we look at economic participation or political participation, we are comparing people of all ages. And people of all ages are people who are 50 years old. And in people of 50 years old, the gaps between men and women in education, for example, are huge. So when you think about staffing a corporation with senior people, or staffing a cabinet, or electing people to parliament, there, the educational gaps are still large for the relevant uh, cohort. So the question is, you know, how much of the check is in the mail? Right? How much of the fact that in the next generation, there will be more women college grads than men college grads, and how much of it is because in spite of having more education, women still cannot make it. That, that is a question that we have ahead of us. And I think that more research will shed a little bit of light as to, as to what, uh, what these issues um, will, will be like. Now, when you think about, okay, what should countries do about this, about the gender gap in general? And the answer is probably extremely different things, extremely different things. There are some countries for which gaps in education and gaps in health are a major pressing issue. There are some countries in which uh, women still are not in school and are getting very little levels of schooling. And these are girls that are 10 years old and we hope that they'll live a long life. So they will be with us for many decades to come with remarkably very little education. At the end of the 21st century, they'll be still here with very, very low levels of education. So I think that for those countries that the issue of education and health is key. For other middle income countries, labor force participation is still, is still very low for women. Um, they're just not going to work. Uh, now, in the rich countries, women are going to work, but we still see very large gaps in income earning capacity between men and women. In the average of, say, Europe, the women make 60% what men make. Why is that so? Big question. Big question. Is it because on average these women have less education than men? Is it because on average these women left the labor market for periods because they had children and so on? Is it because of discrimination? What is it? I think that's a very important issue for national discussion. And finally, there's the political dimension. Uh, there are some countries in which, a, on average, women have 14% participation in parliament, in Congress, and in senior government positions, and so on. So, is this something that should be addressed with uh, quotas? 
with more activist policies? Is this something, does it make, does it make a difference if, if you impose some of these rules? I mean, is the fact that you force women into these positions, does that actually make a change? <coughs> or does that only change the cosmetics? There's starting to be a, a, a more and more research that appears to show that it actually matters. That the gender composition of decision makers actually matters for the kinds of decisions that they make. But this is an, a, 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 an, an open question. So the rankings among the rich countries are mostly dominated by variations on political participation. And the changes, the differences between rich countries and poor countries are mainly dominated by a, a, education, health, and, and, and labor force participation. So at countries at different levels of income, the issues about the gender gap present themselves very differently. And I hope that this, this uh, uh, index will help countries understand where they rank in, in each dimension and what are the relevant issues to discuss uh, publicly. Thank you very much.